I'm going to be talking today, um, as Ed says, about some work that I've been doing editing letters, some letters by Don Jonathan Swift, some love letters that he wrote to two women in Dublin. But I wanted to start off by locating those letters within the tradition, literary traditions of romantic love, and particularly to Valentine's Day. And I was thinking about Valentine's Day and what it means and the conventions around it, and it seems to me that one of the funny things about Valentine's Day is that we think it's a day on which we declare ourselves in the most kind of straightforward, open and self-proclaiming way to the object of our affection. But it's not all about self-declaration because it's partly about hiding yourself, it's half, half, partly about keeping something back, which is obviously your identity. We sign these Valentine's cards with a question mark, typically. Um, so I, was I want to talk a bit about that, about the idea of secrecy and anonymity that's traditionally associated with declarations of romantic love. And I also want to talk about another feature of Valentine's Day, which is cliché, which is the problem of trying to say I love you in a different way from all the other millions of people who've said it throughout the course of time. So my title, With Undying Love, Yours? Question mark, alludes to both of those characteristics, to the idea of cliché and the idea of anonymity or secrecy. So just to talk about where both of those ideas have come from, the whole notion of secrecy, secrecy and anonymity, of not just fully declaring yourself, we can trace that right back in literature to the 11th and 12th century and the troubadour tradition, and then the idea of courtly love that comes from that, because loads of the ideas that we have about romantic love and the ways in which we express it come from there. So the idea that you um, say that your um, lover's mouth looks like a red rose, the idea of kind of golden hair of admiring a woman on a pedestal in a kind of slightly, un um, who like, seems slightly unattainable, those all come from a tradition of courtly love. So we have this built-in idea that there's something secret and hidden fr right from, from back then. And then the other thing, this idea of cliché or the idea that you're it's difficult to get away from expressing yourself through second-hand sentiments, through other people's words. That also has a long literary history. And a really famous example um, of, of someone playing around with that and articulating just that problem of how you say it again and how you say it new is Shakespeare, who, here we've got sonnet number 130, My Mistress Eyes Are Nothing Like the Sun. And this is a poem which is all about how you do it differently, how you make your words different from everybody else's words. So he's saying, My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. And he runs through all these comparisons and says, you know, all this stuff, they don't really apply to you. You're not quite like that. And then at the end he says, and yet by heaven, I think my love, as rare as any she, belied with false compare. So he's talking about the idea of false comparison. He's talking about the idea that the fact that all these other people have, have said these things, but actually um, it doesn't matter that they, they use those hackneyed phrases, but he really loves this woman. She is absolutely fantastic. And it, the fact that she doesn't measure up to those kinds of cliches doesn't matter. So this establishes, I think, it gives us a really good example of of a kind of interest in the problems of how to say it in a different way, how not to use other men's words. So we can see we've got these two ideas about cliché and about anonymity. And at the moment I'm working on some letters by Jonathan Swift. I'm editing them for um, a new edition by Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. And these letters, just to set the scene, these letters are a series of 65 letters that Swift writes to two women who are living in Dublin at the beginning of the 18th century. And they're called, oh, I've got some pictures, hang on, I must forget that. Picture of Jonathan Swift there. Um, and this is a picture of the two women that he's writing to. So Esther Johnson, we can see. And then poor old Rebecca Dingley hasn't got her, a picture surviving, but I think she'd be quite pleased with this, with the silhouette I've given her. So there's Swift, and he's writing to Esther Johnson and to Rebecca Dingley. Um, and the letters are really interesting. They're a mix of things. They're a combination of high politics, of what he's had for lunch, who he's seen, who he's played cards with. But they also contain, at the end of every day, he signs off with a passage of affectionate endearment, um, endearment towards these two women. And the distinctive thing, well, there are two distinctive things about these passages. One of them is that they're written in this kind of baby language, which has come to be called the little language. 
And the other thing is that all those passages of endearment are then crossed out by him before he sends the letters. Um, and there was quite a, lot, a couple of weeks ago, there was quite a lot of press coverage of the, kind of, of the work that I've been doing on the letters. And you can see there some of the brilliant headlines. Swift, le- Swift well, total, there was, my son was involved spuriously in this exercise because he, uh, I said that his list helped me to understand the ways in which the letters were written in baby talk. So there's one headline for the Guardian about the role of the toddler. There's another one playing on the idea of the modest proposal. And the most brilliant one was the independent one, which was Dirty Dean, what Andy Gray could have learnt from Swift. And that was playing on the idea that both Andy Gray and Swift say inappropriate things around women, so we can think about them together. So I've talked a little bit about this elsewhere. Um, Just to have a quick look at how the letters and how they work then. You've got... You can see here, this is an image of one of the letters, and all those little squiggly, squirrely, blacked-out bits are the crossings out over the passages of intimacy, frequently where he's using the little language or his special pet terms for the women. So he squirrels them out before he does each letter. And if you want a couple of examples of the baby language and the way it works, we've got here, do seep and rove pudifer, so night dealist loaves, which clearly means go to sleep and love pudifer. Pudifer is his little name for himself. So night dearest rogues. And then another one is, who must not know these things? They are secrets, and we must co- keep them from naughty dollars. You mustn't know these things. They're secrets, and we must keep them from naughty girls. So you can see the way in which he's using this as a kind of, it becomes an affectionate way of talking to these two women. And thinking, going back to this whole idea of conventions around the expression of romantic love and the idea of trying to express yourself in a new and novel and personal way, I think that that may start to explain why he chose to use this baby language to talk to these women in, because in a way it becomes a special language that they've got between the two of them. It enables him, however weird we think it is, it enables him to get beyond those stereotypical and and kind of hackneyed phrases for the expression of love. So I think we can relate that back to the idea of kind of making it new and making it different. And then thinking about the crossing out business, um, if I give you here, this is an example of some of the crossings out. So the top bit, you can see some lines of text, and then that squiggly kind of barbed wire looking thing is the crossing out that he did over the top of the writing. It used to be assumed that that crossing out was done by a later editor who was trying to censor the letters, but for a variety of reasons, to do with the consistency of the ink and internal references, I think that Swift um, did it himself before he sent the letters, which is kind of doubly weird. First of all, he writes in baby language, and then he does crossing out over the top in order to disguise it. But I think one way in which we could think about the crossing out business is as part of this tradition of self-hiding, of kind of revealing yourself and then not revealing yourself at the same time that I talked about earlier. So in this example, you can see that he writes this, go play cards and be melly de loaves, a rove pudifer who roves mudder betels than his rife, which means go play cards and be merry, dear rose, and love pudifer who loves mudder, mudder is his little name for them, better than his life, farewell, dear list. And then all those abbreviations are just, we don't really know what they mean. They're a little kind of code about intimacy intimacy that he has between them, that they have between the three of them. And then we've got another example here where you can see, again, that he's crossed out over the tops of of the ending of the letter. And he writes there, O poo puppet, lay down your heads again. Face I fladivy. I always reckon if you're ill, I should hear it. And he's saying there, O poor puppet, lay down your head again. Um, Face, I forgive you. Um... So you can see here that this is a way of, you know, he says, these, he says these affectionate things and then he kind of unsays them at the same time. And I guess what, what the kinds of things that I've been talking about, about traditions of expressing yourself in romantic love, can help us to understand why one historical person might use these material things, pen and ink, and the words on a particular individual historical letters that he sent to two people, how we might put that back into a longer history of how people have struggled to express themselves or struggle to express concepts of romantic love or express their feelings for someone else and to make sense of it. And I guess to put it in a nutshell, we could say that what all this is showing us is that in literature, sometimes saying I love you can be the hardest thing to say. Thank you.